Great. Um, well, welcome uh, everybody to uh, the final afternoon uh, of the Crisis of Caring Conference presented by the National Humanities Center. I'm Dr. Sneha Mantry. I'm an assistant professor of neurology and director of the program in medical humanities at Duke University. I was also founding editor of the Intima, a journal of narrative medicine. Um, and I remain very involved in uh, writing uh, as uh, a form of uh, therapeutic practice in narrative medicine and in medical education. Um, as a neurologist, I work with patients with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. And as a medical humanist, my interests involve the imaginative formation of physicians, particularly, again, the use of creative writing to improve our understanding of patient experiences and to mitigate physician burnout. I'll be moderating this session as well as presenting uh, this panel on genres of empathy, along with my fellow presenters, Max Aguilera Helwig and Shelley Wall. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce my co-panelists. Um, and you can find fuller bios of all of our conference presenters on the National Humanities Center website for this conference. Um, Max Aguilera Helwig is not only an award-winning photographer and filmmaker, he's a trained physician whose work reflects an intimate appreciation of the human body at its most vulnerable. Max has produced iconic images for a wide range of publications, including Time, Newsweek, Esquire, Rolling Stone, Stern, Discover, Scientific American, and the magazines of the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. He's also lectured widely on the art of photography. Books of his work include Breaking 100, a series of portraits and interviews with centenarians, The Sacred Heart, an atlas of the body seen through invasive surgery, and Humanoid, an exploration of the way scientists and engineers are creating robots with human attributes. Shelley Wall is Associate Professor of Biomedical Communications and Illustrator in Residence in the Temerity Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and is a fellow of the Association of Medical Illustrators. In addition to being a highly trained and gifted artist, Shelley holds a PhD in English literature and a master's of science in biomedical education, uh, biomedical communication, excuse me. Her scholarly research involves graphic medicine, patient education, the visual construction of gender in medical discourse, the history of medical and bioscientific illustration and the socio-cultural dimensions of medical visualizations. Um, welcome to you both. I'm so glad that we have a chance to speak together this afternoon. Um, for those listening um, at home, we will begin with a discussion amongst um, our panelists um, and we'll start to address audience questions um, either as they come up or uh, particularly in the last uh, about 30 minutes of our session. So for those of you who are watching live on YouTube, feel free to enter questions or comments in the chat at any time. So I wanted to sort of um, get things started among us by, you know, thinking about our, um, our roles and, and the role of creativity in, I think, all of our lives. Um, you know, all of us sort of hold um, multiple selves. Um, I'm a neurologist and a writer of historical fiction. Max, you're, a, you're trained as a physician and, and a filmmaker and photographer. Shelley, you work closely in um, medical humanities and in sort of graphic uh, medicine and medical illustration. Um, I was wondering if, if the two of you could perhaps reflect a little bit about how um, that creativity um, has influenced your relationship to the medical field and to medical education. Well, I'll, I will start, I guess. Um, first of all, I feel, I, I feel honored to be in the presence of two actual physicians because I'm, while well, I'm a doctor, I'm only medically adjacent. Um, in my field. Um, I guess where my 
background in arts and humanities has influenced where I've ended up is um, arises in, 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 the, in the way that uh, medical illustration is a very instrumental art. I mean, it's about, it involves tremendous amounts of creativity and ingenuity um, and cultural awareness, but it's also not about self-expression in that it has to be, it has to achieve a very specific purpose with very accurate information that is very precisely delineated. Um, as a someone with my background in the humanities, I was, um, I've always been very curious about even when you're dealing with sort of objective informational images, there's all sorts of other messages embedded in there, which is why I started thinking about uh, representations of gender, because there's a kind of, I was working on um, information for patient education uh, platform about intersex conditions about 20 years ago when um, people were, it, it was just starting to be, there was a movement among people who had been designated as intersex and um, it was becoming a more visible thing. Um, and the kind of the, the assumed binary that is in, that is implicit in the way sexual differentiation is represented as opposed to a spectrum of variation. And so how do those like the visual languages of even objective factual uh, images contain all of these other messages? Um, and then since then, I've, I've started to work a lot more in graphic medicine, um, much more from the humanities perspective of embedding individual experiences in narrative um, rather than strictly conveying information, although there's always some, uh, well, for example, in Peter Dunlap Scholl's My Degeneration, which is a graphic memoir about his diagnosis with young onset Parkinson's, there's definitely an educational component there where he's explaining bradykinesia and all the different kinds of things that, um, the different effects that the, that the illness has. Um, but from, as a humanist, I'm very interested in his individual experience and his representation of the, what it feels like to, uh, to be diagnosed at that young age. Max, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I think you might be muted, Max. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay. So you said something there that made me think, oh yeah, okay, this is where I'm gonna go and I'm gonna get into answering this question. When I had been a photographer and filmmaker for a long, long time before I entered medicine and, and I've been doing that since I was a child and had I known where photography was gonna lead me, I, I in all the things that I've done with it, I would since I was a child, I would know, I couldn't imagine. And when I, you know, entered medicine the, the day I decided to become a doctor, someone told me that day I, I was going to decide to do that, I would think, what are you talking about? You know, I, I had no pretensions or ideas about that. I'd never gone to college. I, I used the emergency room, like most people, for my doctor. I thought a pediatrician was a foot doctor. Um, and... Um, but I was on an assignment photograph, a, a neurosurgeon, and walked into an operating room the day I spent that day with her, the four days with her, and, and looked inside the human body, and it was a, a life-altering experience looking inside the human body as a naive person with no science background, although I had been photographing science for a long, long time, and I found it utterly fascinating on all levels and just loved it. Did, didn't know what these things were, didn't know what they were talking about, and but but got involved with the imagery in 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 in, in ways, and and from that first photograph, I, I I I I needed to experience that sense of awe over and over again. And I started talking my way in, into operating rooms, going to magazines I was working for, um, saying, "Hey, let me." Do your your medical stories, and then I tuck my way into back in the opera room because I need to experience that sense of awe over and over again because it was it was like going to the moon, and 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 to look inside your own body, this thing that that we're totally that's totally hidden from us, 
we have no idea what it is and to be able to look in, inside our body through the permission of of, of the hospital and, and the patient and 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 the, the doctors and and going in there was just an amazing journey that i went on and but i had all these questions that had nothing to do with medicine or 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 you know they were like for lack of a better word spiritual questions like where do we reside where where is it where's consciousness where you know what what is it who are we what where is it that's us you know where do we go when we're under anesthesia and things like this but as i continued to work on this i wanted to well how does the blood flow you know and 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 then what, what happened to the patient what did did, did you know, they get better you know and and but from that very first day i knew i wanted to become a doctor because i knew you know as a photographer you 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 get to be in the most amazing places it's like gump or zelig or you know walter Mitty. you 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 find yourself in the most phenomenal places but being in the operating room looking inside the human body was the most intimate most precious place i'd ever been and i knew this is where i want to spend the rest of my life because this was the most amazing journey to be on and the best place to do that was being the doctor but i had plunked out of trigonometry in high school i was dyslexic and, and had add i would find out later and and they were explaining z one day um you know going into the wall but the guy explained it in words and in, in high school and i couldn't know what the hell he was talking about because if he had put it on, on drew it i could understand but as a as explaining in words didn't know what to say anyway he flunked me out of class but I went on and became a doctor. And when I became a doctor and went through medical pre-med and medical school, I put art, photography, filmmaking. I had, I had a deal in Hollywood to make a feature film a few years before. I put that all behind me. And I, I was very cynical about it. I thought making art was stupid, vapid, saving people's lives. That is, is the worthy thing. Being an artist was stupid. It was a stupid thing to do. But to the, the journey to become a doctor, that was the, that's where I, that's, that was the hero's journey. That's what I had to do. And, and people said, wait, Max, you're going to go, you're going to, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to become a doctor. You're going to do it. You're going to come back and be a photographer. You're going to go back to be, making films. I thought, you're, you're an idiot. I'm not going to do that. No way. And, 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 you know, I thought about it, I said, the only way I would ever do that is if I was, I was drawn to it, if I had to do it, just like anything else, just like this thing that drew me into, into medicine, it was going to draw me back. Only if I was like, I, I had, I, I, I was going to have to do it. And, but I couldn't imagine me. And, and so I, I, when I was in the hospital, I never thought about photography. I never, you know, maybe I would kind of, you know, I never composed because as a photographer, I'm always composing. I'm always looking at reality on several different levels. I'm always seeing things. Is that a picture? Is that, you know, is this, this, you know, I'm always recomposing what's going on and looking at it. I watch movies all the time. I watch television all the time. You think, look, this guy's just, you know, a, you know, a, what do you call it? A sofa junkie or what do you call those people? But, but I'm, I'm, cause I'm analyzing stories and narratives and, and experiences in my life to see what the story is. And how, how can I tell the story? How can I take this picture? But, but in the hospital, I didn't do that. No, I was involved in the patients and taking care of them and being a doctor. This is being a doctor is serious business. And I wasn't a doctor until I walked into, I didn't wear my scrubs out onto the street. I didn't, I don't call myself doctor today. I don't use MD unless I need to in the, in the, in the, in the process of, of, of doing my work when I need people to know that I speak their language. I, 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 I you know, and I use, when I was in, walked in the doors, it was, it's serious business taking, having that responsibility over people's lives. And but when I left, the day I left, I got to this place where saving people's lives, making art, same thing. And, and, and I rarely tell that to people, but I'm going to take the gamble. I'm with a crowd. I can say that too. Because it sounds very flippant. Saving someone's life. 
and 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 when I finished my intern year, when I was a pre med, I read, I, I I picked up this book called House of God by by Samuel Shem. Because that's the right book you read when you're a pre med. It's about a guy's first year and 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 um, intern year at, at at one of the Harvard Medical Schools. Fictional based on his real life about a, a guy, I forgot what his real name is. Maybe it's, I forgot, he's, his pseudonym is Sam Shemmer, that's his name. But but I started reading it and I thought, oh, this is stupid. This is vapid. This is so cynical, treating patients like this. When I finished my intern year, I asked my, my now ex-wife, I said, where's that book? Where's that book? And I picked it up and I said, oh my, oh my God. This was my intern year. It was exactly like this. All that horrible, stupid stuff. The kind of things that happen in residency and in internship. It was like this. Treating patients like this. Discharge, discharge, discharge. Get them off my list. Get them off my list. You know, that's what it was like. You know, and, and I found myself in that book. You know. I was going to let people admit them to the hospital because they'll get sicker in the hospital. They get sicker in the hospital. I would only admit them when I was a resident, second year resident. I would only admit you if you needed to be in the hospital, if we could help you. But if we couldn't help you, I wasn't going to admit you into the hospital. And, oh. and I'm sorry. Oh no! I, I was just saying that. Um, that anyway, no. anyway, this this is so. It it's what I'm. I just want to say to you. This, this is my this is my experience. And when when I left, I realized, you know, and the things that drew me out, I just just cut to it. Is that I realized, you know, I I, I came out and um, I I I, um, I realized making art and the the, the power what I could do. When I, when I looked at, at, at the ads that, that were in the medical journals to doctors, an elephant sitting on someone's chest for CPOD, I thought it was stupid. This is that era of, of ER and stuff. Okay, well, yeah, that's a metaphor, whatever. But you can just, you know, this is a, a, an ad to doctors, you know, went to medical school. We just been, went through gross, uh, gross anatomy and you know, we have responsibility over people's lives. Just talk to us straight. Not only that, I have responsibility over a patient who has a, a COPD. I got to talk to them straight. They have need to know what's going on here. If they, if I need to tell them, it's like an elephant sitting on your chest. They know what that feels like, but they have real experiences that they need to to understand and know so they can make the best decision for their care. And that's the level of communication that I wanted to leave medicine for and come out and, and do. I'll leave it at that. Well, that's so interesting. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Max, for sharing um, those, those stories. I mean, I think, um, I think a lot of what you say about the challenges um, that we face working in, you know, the modern healthcare environment really sort of resonate with me as well. Like, at least for me, I sort of, I, I sort of knew that I wanted to go to medical school when I was in high school and college. And I kind of checked all the boxes and did all the right things and took the MCAT. And then um, I actually, I had been, uh, as an undergraduate, I majored in comparative literature. And I remember um, sort of right as I was turning in my, my senior thesis, um, on, um, it, it was a literary analysis of sort of the perception of, or, or the um, uh, illness and hypochondriasis in enlightenment literature. And I just had this sort of almost like a crisis moment where I was like, I really love this. I, I don't want to give this up. How am I going to continue doing this um, in medical school and in residency when, you know, it is really challenging, I think, to continue um, continue an artistic practice and a creative practice. Um, but I think, you know, what, what you said is that it's, it really is so necessary and it's been so necessary for me. I mean, I remember, especially during my clerkship year of medical school, feeling so morally injured by the things that I was seeing, the patients who were 
so sick and were hospitalized and it felt like we were we weren't able to help them in the way that they needed help um and and that's really i think one patient in particular um who uh was very very sick and, and dying and nobody was was able to tell him that he was dying um really it remains sort of one of these patients that has has his story has stuck with me and i realized it's kind of at that moment that if I was going to, if I was going to continue in medicine, um, I needed to find a way to tell those stories and understand those stories. And that's what sort of led me back into literature um, with the, uh, I did a master's in narrative medicine at Columbia, um, absolutely wonderful program. And I really, I think it sort of shaped my, my career. I mean, I, I still, I, I write, although I've, you know, not been writing, at least not um, explicitly about patients, because I worry about the ethics of that um, on a number of levels, but about these, I think, deeper um, ethical issues, Max and, and Shelley, that you raise, like how are we as a, as a society and as the medical field, how are we training our learners to think about um, patients um, as cases or as people? And what are all of the what is all of the the human variety um, that we see in in um, medical practice that sort of gets you know reduced to algorithms and to tables for the students to memorize and then you know answer multiple choice questions about like there's so much more to medical practice than than that. Um, yeah, and I'd actually to and to that point, I I'm thinking about that elephant, Max, the elephant on the chest. And um, I think that's, you know, every, every kind of image has its place where it's appropriate. The thing about that image is it might not instruct doctors about, you know, the pathophysiology of COPD, but it shows them what it feels like to be a patient with COPD. And it might show a patient that someone understands what it feels like, like what the affective dimension of that disease is and and that's an important thing it's it's not all the information you need but i think that's a really important there's a, an important moment for that kind of visual metaphor i i i think so i yeah yeah it's a great metaphor but what i've found is that in marketing in 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 things even like hipaa there are boundaries or walls that people have that they keep up for whatever reasons where they go back to the thing where they will not tell the patient that they're dying they they withhold the truth that they won't look at what's really going on i i, I was trying i was before coming to this i was trying to remember what the deal was i had a, a call from an agency that was looking for some pro bono, um, uh, wanting to uh, do doing a pro bono ad, a big ag ad agency about doctor burnout. About, about doctor burnout, and they wanted to they wanted to look at my my archives to 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 look at the pictures. So I you know photographed in, in hospitals tons and tons and tons, and so I showed them all these pictures, and I, I talked to all these these execs from whatever, and and. As I was showing, and I, I, I can't remember the exact poignant examples, they closed their ears to the truth, to the depth of, the, 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 of what's going on here. And they kept up this wall of what, you know, and, and they, no, 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 you know, like this. So they, they so, you know, they, they'll, you know, they'll, there's something about wanting to hold on to the picture. If I want to push this thing further, as I've been working with HIPAA as a doctor and, and then as a journalist all these years, and I've researched this, I come to, under, to think now that HIPAA, which, was, which, which came out was early, in the early days, shortly after the, the, um, the uh, Tuskegee, um, syphilis, um, 
a, a experiment. Horrific thing. They they came out that just after that as a way to to um, um, the early form of HIPAA. It wasn't called HIPAA, but was as a, as a kind of well, let, you know, we're going to protect these people by having something like a HIPAA. That's when it was the early parts of it. That's my research on, on this whole thing. And then twenty year twenty it took twenty or thirty years later in the nineteen nineties in the Clinton era that HIPAA came together to protect these people. But over the years. And and I be- dealt with this with this wall of HIPAA. That what it really is, it's not about protecting the patients, it's protecting the hospitals and the pharmaceutical companies. It's not about protecting the patients. It's about protecting the corporations and the hospitals and the government. Yeah, I mean, I think patients. there's. There, there are certainly a lot of sort of structural issues around um, who has, who has, I guess, power, right? And who has power to, to dictate or, or to, um, to, to approve how images or patient stories um, are used and, and shared, um, for sure. I mean, particularly, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, as a, as a neurologist, as a movement disorder specialist, we often... Um, will show videos of patients as an educational tool um, to you know students and residents um, because so much of what I do is about pattern recognition um, and sort of video uh, visual um, uh, visual learning um, and actually that links to one of the questions that has just come in um, from our audience um, from Tracy Brimhall. Um, uh, she says, um, I'd love to hear from Shelley Wall and whether images you know, that are meant to teach can also invoke empathy, um, thinking about images like the anatomical Venuses and how a, a teaching tool can also elicit emotion in a, in a learner. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question, Tracy. And I think, I think inevitably, Maybe I can't make this absolute statement, but images carry emotion and they evoke emotion, even if they are, you know, even if they're images that are just meant to carry information. Um, And I think that's something that gets overlooked sometimes. Um, The anatomical venuses, I'm sure uh, most people recognize those, but they're, um, I think of like 18th century anatomical wax figures and the anatomical venuses were these beautiful, often quite, you know, uh, languorous women reclining and they could be kind of opened up like a, um, opened up like a gift box to reveal the different organs and you would eventually get down to maybe a little uterus with a little fetus in it or something. Um, And uh, so there's that, they're sort of they're beautiful. They're, there's also, I mean, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things you could say about gender and power and the anatomical Venus. Um, but a more contemporary example uh, I'm thinking of, I'll go back to creating images for, um, for it was for patient education for the hospital for sick children for their intersex clinic, and a lot of uh, just visual descriptions of sex differentiation are just little balls and sticks. Like here's the different genitals and here's the clitoris and here's the penis. And they just are these little shapes or these, I mean, even any kind of patient education where the body is fragmented and you just see, you know, you just see the stomach, you just see the lungs. One of the really important things in creating the um, intersex site was not to pathologize these variations. And one way of, of reinforcing that idea that this is, this is not pathological. I mean, there might be medical complications, which have in some cases, which have to be dealt with, but this variation in and of itself is not a pathology. And to do that, it was really important to situate those, those genitals, which were the focus of so much kind of um, Foucaultian regulation. Um, to situate them in the context of a baby who is a little person, you know, with um, who is lovely and and has all sorts of other things about it. Um, so, so situating that 
accurate anatomical embryological information in the context of, um, you know, how it's situated in the context of like a diagrammatic baby or someone that looks like an actual baby. So, I, I mean, I hope, Tracy, that's kind of approaching your, um, an answer to your question, or at least a, a suitable response to your question. Yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing that, Shelley, because I think that's a really um, that's a really um, illustrative forget forgive the pun um, a really kind of I think important moment or an important thing for all of us to keep in mind. I mean, particularly when we're thinking about um, intersex uh, individuals or or sort of the the depiction of gender in medical education, both on the patient side um, and on the clinician side. Um, uh, to be aware of, I guess, that, you know, a, a body part does not exist in isolation, right? Um, and, and all of the kind of the, the swirling otherness or, or the swirling togetherness, I guess I should say, of, of everything else about a person. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly see that, I guess, the, the, um, in my clinical practice with folks who um, come in with, you know, MRI findings that I have to kind of go over, right? Um, and and sort of contextualizing that image, that sort of 2D black and white series of images on a screen with the patient in front of me. Um, and, you know, what is um, what is meaningful and, and, and how to interpret um, an image in the context of, of a, a person. Um, very much. Um, and I think that also kind of gets to, you know, one of the other um, things that I wanted us to kind of talk about um, in this, in, in this conversation, you know, when we think about um, in the humanities, we'll often talk about not only what a work of art says, but what it does. Um, and so what sorts of things um, can sort of aesthetic object, you know, art, literature, um, performance, um, what can these things do for people who are truly suffering from sickness or pain or, or otherwise in medical care? Like what is the therapeutic function of art in professional uh, healthcare settings? Yeah, and I guess, there, well, there, maybe it's important to make a, a distinction here between art uh, directed at patients or for patients or therapy for patients. And then there's art as therapy, <laughs> therapy and a reflective tool for medical trainees. As, and I think those are, um, obviously there's a great deal in common, but maybe those are two different aspects of the conversation that we should kind of distinguish at this point. Yeah, that is a good point because I think, you know, um, the way that at least that I use art, um, uh, visual art or, or written uh, text with my trainees is perhaps serving a different function um, than it would be, right, if I were thinking about it in terms of patient education or kind of patient, patient facing uh, work compared yeah. to clinician facing work. And even just art as an instructive tool and art as a reflective tool. Uh, one of a very, um, one of the, my colleagues who I collaborate with a lot, who is also a very close friend, is an art therapist. And we had a friendship before we had a sort of professional collaboration. Um, but we had often said, we both work in these sort of healthcare fields. We both work with visual art. Surely we can do something together. But it took us a long time to figure out how to bring those things together because the way she works with images and mark making and the way I've been trained to work with images of mark making, it was, it was almost like they were in two different kind of dimensions that didn't quite meet up. And, and it was really exciting to sort of figure out how to, how to marry those things. Um, not, to, not so that they're, they're accomplishing the same thing, but we sort of look at what each modality accomplishes and how those can complement each other. Yeah, yeah. So what was your approach then to be able to bring those two things together? Well, what we were mainly working with, um, like what she does as an art therapist and not what I do as a medical illustrator, but what I do in terms of graphic medicine and having people craft 
visual narratives. And um, she said, what, what art accomplishes or mark making, not to kind of like, because art comes with all sorts of assumptions, the word art, what mark making accomplishes in her practice is giving expression to what in her words is unwordable. She said, my patients don't have narrative, they have utterance and because she works a lot with um, in trauma therapy. And she said, you know, it's, 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 it's utterance, it's not a story yet. And so we developed um, this, not, this is not a mode of therapy, but a, a workshop for medical trainees, medical practitioners, people in similar fields to think about that move from utterance to narrative. So um, mark making and then thinking, how do we make sense of that to string it together into a coherent story? Because that's kind of the process of, of therapy. And so using the tools of graphic medicine to look at much more kind of um, visceral forms of mark making and how those things can complement each other. Oh yeah, no, that's, 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 I think a really, really um, interesting approach. You know, like when you say, um, you know, these patients, um, particularly patients who've gone through trauma or who are in sort of a, a different space, I guess, in the, in the medical world. Um, uh, sometimes I think about, you know, the work of Arthur Frank as well, um, who's a, a sort of a big name in the medical humanities. Um, but one of the things that I think he, he writes about really well is this idea of the chaos narrative and, and the idea that some, uh, some patients, some families are, are struggling um, to string a story together in, you know, in words or, or in, a, in a cohesive or coherent way. And, and what they're experiencing is is a form of chaos, right? It's, it's all of these things happening all at once. And it's, it's hard, I think, uh, when people are in that, that space to, for them to get a foothold and to, to start to create that narrative. Um, it's hard sometimes as the clinician to figure out, you know, where in the story do I start? Do I start to write my, my own history of present illness and, you know, and my note on this individual, um, but I, I, I really like the idea of using graphic medicine as perhaps an entry point there, because I think I think graphic medicine does offer um, this, as you said, very visceral um, quality to you know by marrying text and and visual skill. It, it really um, I've seen some some graphic medicine graphic memoirs that are just really incredibly powerful. Um, at conveying that. Yeah, well, it just, I, I'll let you, I'll let you come in here in, in a second, Max. I just want to say one thing about, uh, to that point, Sneha, um, referring back to my degeneration and Dunlap Scholl, who was an, an illustrator and cartoonist before his diagnosis, retrained himself in a new way of drawing. And the mark making that he uses to tell his story, it captures all of the kind of like just teetering on the edge of lack of control of, of Parkinson's. So it's right there in the marks themselves in sort of jagged lines and sort of approximate shapes. It's incredibly powerful in that, in that way. Max, how does, um, I was watching some of your robotics films on your website. Mm -hmm. um, how do you like how does narrative and imagery and sort of the human experience I was watching um, I forget the I forget the name of the, of the clip about where the person is interacting with a kind of therapist like yeah mm -hmm. Rod. Mm -hmm. um, how does that kind of narrative how do you see it uh, kind of working into this conversation Well, I guess I could only talk about it in terms of how I see what was going on there or looking at the robots that, that you know, my, my first work that brought me into medicine was photographing surgery. And so I looked at the body as as the human anatomy as the parts of human anatomy and looking at it as a machine so the and understanding and then going through medical training, 
you do gross anatomy and physiology and you learn, you know, the body is, is a machine uh, through, um, and, it, and, it, and the various different functions of, of physiology and as different things work and, and, and synergy in, in different parts, um, be it blood pressure and, and, um, or, or mechanics of, of um, muscular contraction. And so when you look at a robot function, it's not too different. If you look at eyes moving in motion, um, they move very much robotic because of the twin motion that they go or whatever, a human being and a robot are somewhat the same. So there's that part of it. And then having had um, the basic sciences, and including you know inorganic chemistry and 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 and, and chemistry and, and understanding um, the periodic table, and just thinking about mathematics, if I can just stretch this out and not try and draw too many things, to 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 diffuse here, but to me everything is mathematics. Photography is mathematics. Human relationships are mathematics. Photographs are mathematics. Everything is an equation, complex equations. And, you know, the planets rotations around the, around the sun, it's mathematics. Everything's mathematics. Everything's an equation of photographers, different photographers approaches to work. You could look at it, that's an equation or a painter's work is there's equations to to solve and such so when you think about artificial intelligence and that's what we're talking about when you look at those robots the idea that a, a, a robot could have human consciousness and that's what's in the video you're talking about besides the machine how can a robot have human consciousness um well what's the difference between or or a uh, uh, carbon and and the next um atom that um um could could um could carry the uh um uh, a proton and electron to have an exchange and and it's just another equation so how could a a, a, a computer which is inside the robot, act very much like what the carbon-based system of, 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 of the human brain, how could those, those things interact? Well, when you do neurology, like, or, or like Seha, Seha um, you understand that this is a, uh, electrons passing through the, the nerves. Well, that's how um, the, the robots are, are, are interacting to move their muscles, to move the motors or whatever. But so the brain interacts through um, um, uh, neurotransmitters. So what's the difference? You have to, it's not too different that something like this could happen. And that's the way uh, computers interact. And, and so it's not too far of a leap. What makes it so special unless you endow it with one's religious thoughts and whatever to think about the soul and whatever. But, this is a human machine, but scientifically, it's all very possible that human consciousness and machine consciousness could ha could could very much happen. And so, with an open mind, and also having worked as a doctor, where you see everything go wrong, and 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 you think about stroke victims, for example, where the the hay why the the um, the the the, the myriad of, of, of cross wires that come out in different ways, if I'm not making you think too diffuse, and, and you see the cross function of, of the different types of bizarre things that can happen in stroke. And you see the, the, the raw work going on in, 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 in the development of, of robot consciousness which has been they've been working on for years and and the and the steps it's not too different some of the experiments and things and seeing these things try and work 
and develop. So with an open mind, like I have in, in, as a doctor and, and, and the stuff, that's how I've approached these things and, and, and such. And um, so when I have um, um, worked as a doctor, I've worked as with an open mind and with, 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 with robots in the same way. I'm not an advocate for robots, but I am incredibly curious about human behavior. And I find robots to be very interesting about what they teach us about human behavior. And, 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 the, and so I'm very fascinated. I wouldn't necessarily want to have a robot in my house and all that stuff, but they are far more advanced. And the research that's going on is far more advanced than people know. And I've been following it for years. And so I find, I've, I've been lucky to be involved with and, and see a lot of things. I've been working on this stuff for 10, 20 years now, photographing, filming robots, maybe 15 years. And yeah, and I mean, I think that's really, really you know, interesting, especially thinking about, I, I know the next session after ours is actually all about sort of the, the speculative future, right? And what the sort of future of caring and, and medicine and health is, is going to look like. And I do think that, you know, you're right, that sort of um, AI or, or robot uh, machine learning is like such a big topic right now. I'm, I, I'd be curious to see if, if the panelists on, on the next panel sort of touch on that. I mean, I think it it also gets back to, to some of the challenges that I think we've um, been talking around in, in our panel around sort of um, the, the narratives that get told around like bionic humans or, or um, the, um, forgive me, but the, the Frankenstein narrative right that that's gotten told over and over around um uh, particular areas i've seen it particularly get get weaponized against transgender individuals for instance um in in a really horrifying way so i think um as we think about what you know the future looks like i think we do have to be aware of 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 much of that right um, and the ways that we as um, people who are involved in medicine and medical education and art, um, you know, creative work can sort of push against um, perhaps some of those um, myth steps or, or miscommunications in, in the way that, that narratives get told and get um, stuck, if you will, in the cultural consciousness. Um, you know, there, there's, there's been, I think, a, a bit of a, a conversation in the chat as well around, um, you know, the roles of um, art or, or what is the, should art have a use, right, in, in medical education? Um, how does it sort of prove its value, um, if you will? Jane Threkill in particular um, is concerned about um, sort of the results oriented or the metrics oriented um, issues of, you know, we, we let people, quote unquote, do art um, because of patient compliance, fewer lawsuits, more efficiencies, and, and so on. And those are all, you know, I think good things to, to have. But is that what, um, is that, is that utility necessary for, for art? I, I, I know that my, the work I did in my, my, my surgery book, which was, which is challenging work, it's difficult to look at. I didn't realize that when I started it, but it, but, but a lot of people have difficulty with it. But a lot of other people find it, it, it um, inspiring. And over the years, I have met doctors, attendings, who uh, surgeons who told me, I, I saw your book when I was a medical student, and it inspired me to become a surgeon. And so art, you know, it, it, the art is inspiring. And 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 not to say, you know, you know, talking about me, but any of this, any of this work is, it's inspiring to to people to become doctors, to 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 do to do things in 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 healthcare on on one level. Um, 
that has great value. Art is inspiring and it can also take us to some really dark places that it's important to go to. Um, I'm looking at, at uh, comment, uh, Anne's comment in the chat about the need to keep talk to keep talk about real practical economic social access, economic and social and access difficulties faced by patients and disabled disabled folks. And um, and I so, so art can be, I mean, yes, the, like images of surgery and even of cadaveric dissections can, you know, they have, I mean, medical art, the history of anatomical art is a history of incredible aesthetic quality but there's also that aspect of like kind of bearing witness I'll, let me, to, I'll really, to difficult things. I'll tell you something about transhumanists. I, I know what, I didn't know what that word was. And I, the first time I met, I, 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 I was introduced to that word, I was going to meet a transhumanist. And that transhumanist is, is a, 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 a transgendered person named Martine Rothblatt. And, 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 um, her her uh, her wife uh, um, Bina Rothblatt, who made who um, made a um, a uh, geminoid a robot of 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 Bina um, uh, to see if you could implant if you can implant a human consciousness inside a a machine. That's how I met them in the course of doing my work. They are two of the most most wonderful human beings you ever met. And after Martine Rothblatt invented Sirius radio, the idea of satellite radio, their four children, their youngest daughter had, um, um, uh, what is it? Um, uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension as a child, very difficult to treat they funded research in that there was an, a drug that one of the pharmaceutical companies was going to orphan and they went and bought it which you cannot do from a pharmaceutical company they keep on they will hold that orphan drug and and and, and kill it they bought it from from them martine did and martine took that through to completion that drug is serves the, the pulmonary hypertension community. They give it away for free for people who do it. And they have a company called United Therapeutics. They are developing all kinds of drugs and are pioneering right now a, um, um, the a xenoplantation of, a, um, of uh, uh, possibly the first human um, um, uh, um, pig uh, a transplant. So you can think all you want about transhumanism because we don't a lot of people will jump to conclusions about something they don't know and a lot of my work is trying to help people to understand these things that they have afraid of and they don't know but there might be more to this than meets the eye there might be more humanity here and martine is one of the most humanity persons and being a that you'll ever meet. And it's more about saving these people that and Boxer, that 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 you you can imagine, you will ever imagine, and they're out there doing it. I mean that's that's wonderful to hear. That's a really, I think, incredible story. Of, it's phenomenal. Um, you would not Yeah. And I mean I think one of the things that really I think stands out to me in, in that tale, right, is that um, people who um, belong to groups that would often be marginalized by the medical system or, or by society at large are the ones who are sort of pushing pushing the rest of us forward, right? Because because um, I think the the structures that we live in and work in are not where they need to be, and that actually kind of I think brings me to one of the other amazing questions in the chat. I don't even know how to like start. Um, but Marina asks about examples of how we can use art, the visual and narrative to bridge one populations across socioeconomic range and, and two across disciplines, um, for instance, architects and public health. I mean, I can certainly, you know, speak from the kind of narrative, the literary side of things like my, my interests 
uh, creatively very much lie within historical fiction, which I think really gives us this opportunity, this window into the world that was, um, because the world that was is the world that led to the world that we live in now, right? And, and so our assumptions and our biases and our lives are so heavily shaped by, um, by history. And, and through the lens of historical fiction, I think it really allows us to hear voices that in their own time may not have been heard um, or, or the people with those voices were trying to speak and were pushed back or, or pushed down. I mean, I'm thinking in particular of, of uh, something I'm working on right now around eugenics um, and sort of the, the voices, the stories of all of the people who were sterilized involuntarily um, with the express, not just assent, but active involvement of the medical community. Like we as a, we as a field are, are very much complicit in all of that and at neurology in particular, but I think across medicine. Um, and so, you know, I think these are stories that at least when I was in medical school and in, in residency training were not discussed at all. And I think they are getting more attention now, um, the attention that they should have deserved. But, you know, the people, unfortunately, who lived through that are aging. Um, many of them are no longer alive. Um, and so how do we tell their stories in sort of an authentic um, and meaningful way um, and honoring what, what we as a community have done, um, acknowledging and, and, and honoring their story? Um, so important. Yeah, incredibly. Um, I'm, yeah. So I'm curious to hear how, how um, you know, you guys, Shelly and Max, think about using um, visual art, for instance, graphic medicine, illustration, photography as a way to sort of um, bring bring populations together or to, to magnify voices that, that don't um, don't get the recognition that they otherwise should deserve. I think I mean one one way the arts can bring people together is through um, co-creation. Um, bringing together different populations to tell their stories to each other and create something together. Um, I'm, I'm, I, th I think this is a great idea. I'm trying to think of a really a, a good example. Um, there's a book that has recently, I think it has recently come out as a publication called The Most Costly Journey. Um, and it was, uh, I'm, I'm, I only have sort of general sense of how the project originated. But it brought together um, artists and people who had the power to make a project happen and get it published with migrant workers who had really powerful stories to tell. And there was, and it wasn't like, here's my story, now you make it into something. It was, you know, it was, I think, a process of kind of mutual creation and, and mutual learning. Um, and there are, I think there are other examples of, um, you know, taking art into communities that might not have uh, kind of venues for expressing themselves and working with, ha having people work together to, you know, learn about each other and to create some sort of object, um, create art um, it, as, as, a, as collaborators. I think that's certainly one way. Um, again, there's that, that word use. Um, I know earlier in the chat, there was uh, someone that had been querying this idea of utility and how do you quantify results and, and Sneha, you had, you had um, spoken to that. Um, but I think the arts can bring people together in, by having people make art together, uh, certainly one way. It, for the artists that are out there, and what in the in the in the realm of the subject that you're talking about, these stories that haven't been told, it can be difficult to bring these stories forward. If they haven't been told before, um, there has been um, my experience is that they have been um, boxed away because people have boxed them away. And it takes, uh, you should not be, um, um, 
you should, you should if you're passionate about this and there's a reason to tell this story and there usually is you should move on these things i i uh there are reasons to tell stories and you need to champion your your whatever you're working on yeah, I, absolutely yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I'll also say, you know, to the second half of Marina's question around bringing together different disciplines like, you know, architects and public health, I think especially the last few years, right, have shown us how deeply connected um, the built environment is to um, existing health disparities, to health outcomes. Um, and so I think it, that's, this, is, this is one of the things, at least, that we have been really focusing on here at at Duke is bringing together different disciplines into the same room to look at things together because all of us have our different professional and personal perspectives. And, and really that sort of interdisciplinary um, environment is I think where um, creativity and, and I hope the future of, of medical education around this really lies. You know, I think it's, it's, um, it's an, it's a big area um, and it's a big question to tackle. But I think one of the nice things about using art, for instance, or, or narrative is that um, it sort of, in some ways, well, not I feel a little strange about saying this, but it, in some ways, at least in the medical community, it kind of uh, levels the playing field in a way, you know, like uh, nobody um, is necessarily an expert. You know, medicine is very built on its hierarchy. And so when you bring in something sort of from left field, if you will, right, like a, a painting and you ask a group of, you know, 10 residents from different disciplines or, or people from different areas of the hospital to look at this painting together, all of them are coming to it with a certain level of unfamiliarity. And that sort of defamiliarization, I think, really can open, open them up to speaking in ways that they otherwise might not um, because they're so, the hierarchy is so heavily ingrained in us, I think, um, to our detriment. That's another cool thing about um, bringing uh, art exercises into, into medical training. Um, in my experience of giving workshops in graphic medicine for medical students, um, is they're, they're, they're out of their area of expertise. And people have to be vulnerable and have to be willing to not, you know, excel at what they're doing, but just kind of have an experience without producing something that is going to, you know, get top marks, um, for example, or look beautiful. Um, it's kind of that, you know, getting back to just you're vulnerable, you're, you know, you're, you're not good at this necessarily, but everyone has a story to tell, everyone can tell the story. So in a way, like there's no, it's not a question of being good at something or not good at something, but, but that sort of discomfort, I think is, uh, can be really, um, it can really shift things. Yeah, one of the, one of the exercises or one of the classes that we teach for our medical students um, is, is having them come together and, um, they write a monologue about some experience that they had in, you know, during medical school, whether it's a professional thing or a personal thing. Um, and then they submit them anonymously and swap, they get swapped and they learn to perform each other's monologues without knowing who wrote what. Mm -hmm. um, and it is such, it's, it's a very scary uh -huh. course in some ways mm -hmm. for the students because it does require yeah. so much vulnerability. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the anonymity really opens them up to talking about things then that I don't think they would have heard, you know, uh, they would have written about um, or spoken about, um, at least not in a, in a semi-public kind of a way. Um, it's the, the stories that I've heard over the last several years of doing this have just been so incredibly moving. And I always ask the students, many of them are, are sort of um, either in their third or fourth year of med school. So thinking about residency and, and sort of moving on and personal statements. And I always ask, you know, is this something that you would write in your personal statement? And they're like, no, I, I would feel too scared 
to put, you know, this really deep part of myself into a, a residency statement, you know, but it's, it's, I think, so critical for people to be able to, um, to express that, that deep vulnerability and to recognize too the, that what they're doing in that process is quite similar to what we ask our patients to do, right? Like we ask our patients to give us a, their story and then we go and you know, tell the attending and we tell the consultation team and it, it gets passed around the hospital um, without the patient necessarily, like the patient has to sort of in some way give up ownership of that story um, in the way the medical system is structured. So it, it really, I think, functions on so many levels um, for the students uh, to go through this exercise. You had, um, toward the beginning of the conversation, Sneha, you had talked about not telling patient stories because of the, because of the ethics. Um, and that's, and that seems, that's obvious. Um, but there's, there is a related question that has often come up in, in conversations I've been part of or have heard about graphic medicine. It's like, whose story can you tell? Um, I've often, I, I want to just for personal reasons, I want to do a work on something which has to do with my late partner who actually had young onset Parkinson's. Um, I was going to, when he was alive, I was going to work with him. And this was sort of agreed between us because I didn't feel like I could even tell my story of the experience of being a caregiver, you know, without telling his story. And was that really, you know, could I do that? And I, and I think this is often a question that comes up because inevitably, even if you're only telling your story, everyone's embedded in a family or community, um, other people's stories intersect with our own all the time. And, and then particularly when you get into the medical field and it's telling stories about that are like, in fact, you know, legally confidential. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure it's a dilemma for writers across writers and creators across you know, many domains, but I think it really seems to come to the fore in, in, in medical stories, I guess, because of the sensitivity of, of health topics and, the, and really profound places uh, in people's lives where those stories um, arise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because again, like, you know, as Max was alluding to earlier, because as physicians, we're sort of, you know, bound by HIPAA. And I certainly, you know, as a, a, as a patient or a family member, I would not want to sort of open, you know, the New Yorker magazine and see my story or my family member story sort of on display, right? Um, so I, I, I'm so careful and respectful of, of my patients' stories and, and their willingness to share stories with me. I have had some patients with whom I have sort of co-constructed um, a, a story or a, a tale. Um, and if at all possible, you know, whether it's you know, the patient or, or a family member in, in one case because the patient had passed away. Um, but it's just such a... Um, it's such a powerful experience. I think even more than um, what I used to do, which was simply sort of go home and, and journal or, or, you know, privately write about my patient experiences, the ones that sort of stick with you um, in, in, a, in a private sort of debrief reflective way, which I do do, but I don't share those publicly at all. Um, but, you know, to, to, co-create a story with somebody else I think just is so challenging and so powerful because the moments that for instance I thought were incredibly meaningful like didn't like it, it was just such an incredible I think creative experience for me um, and something that I think I'll, I'll do again if I have the, the opportunity because I learned a lot as a writer but also as a doctor through that process. I find in my work, I value my subjects so, so much. And I feel it's such a privilege, such a privilege when they open up to me and allow me to hear their story, to tell their story, to let me photograph and film them. 
and I I I view a, a photo consent consent the way I do a a consent for a procedure, and I defend it with that veracity. I would either. It's such a privilege for them to let me into their lives. How how do you kind of navigate that? Um, like, it was, if you how do you approach someone about getting that access and gaining that trust? In some ways, I'm if I'm working in a hospital, I'm working with the the public affairs person, and and um, some can be uh, you know generally very helpful, and through that way you meet someone and and you can. Um, um, it through honesty, through telling them this is who I am, this is what we're doing, and 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 taking it step by step, and not not um, not hiding uh, what something is. There could be misunderstandings in a situation, especially in a hospital. If people don't know who you are, and there you are with a camera. I I will hide my cameras. I don't bring them out and tell hide them because patients who uh, and family members who aren't involved. They will think, what well, you know, what's going on here? So they don't need to be shocked at the wrong time. So I bring them out in the appropriate time, um, and when when it's all when everyone knows what's going on. But even still, that could be misunderstood. And I thought it was an appropriate time, and I've I've had those challenging situations, and I've met them head on and with respect. And I've learned in those situations um, that um, I take no for an answer. As of generally as a photographer, you you talk your way. Um, you don't take no for an answer as a journalist, but in the hospital, I take no for an answer in the patient's um, condition and the and, and their care is is takes primacy. And but in I but I have also worked on the streets, and uh, you know and worked in dangerous environments and and whatever. And and I will I work by myself. I won't go with other people because I know how to handle myself, but I will approach people in the same kind of way. Just this is who I am, this is what I do. I don't hide. I, I go, this, I, you know, because hiding looks like you're sneaky or whatever. I just go on bold face, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, you know, and people don't want to be photographed. I'm, that's fine, you know, and, um, and um, I ask their permission and they say yes. And we take it step by step, and I've I develop wonderful relationships with people, and I, sometimes I forget to take pictures because I'm just talking. You know, I have long, close friendships with these people. You know, a very close uh, friendship. I've been working on a story right now for two and a half, two almost three years, a COVID story that's yet to be published. And I, these are people are dear, very dear to me. And there are other stories, my robot people or whatever, other people everywhere. I'm thinking that that's really moving. And I think that really um, illustrates the, again, the, the power, perhaps the unexpected power sometimes that, that this work has to kind of bring in, bring people into our lives that we might not ordinarily have met or, or known, right? And how those, those experiences will enrich us. Um, I actually, well, now my brain's going in kind of two different directions. One is, um, you know, I think it's, it's hard in this current environment to, to not acknowledge COVID, um, and how that has really so profoundly changed both medical practice, um, and healthcare and, and all of our lives, uh, both in and outside, you know, the medical world. Um, uh, but I also, I guess want to link it to something that came up in the chat earlier and, and our conversation kind of went elsewhere, but, but, um, you know, James Rako asks about turning the focus on clinicians and what their narratives are regarding how their work does or doesn't heal does or doesn't cause suffering. Um, and, and sort of where the, where the role of art and literature kind of fall in, in that, I think that is one area perhaps where COVID did sort of, open the door um, or or make us more aware of this kind of growing 
the crisis of caring, right? The sort of theme of this whole conference um, and the, the burnout and moral injury that's been building for decades. I mean, right? Like you can read House of House of God was mentioned earlier by Max. That, that is very much a, a burnout and moral injury and sort of um, the challenges of being an intern, um, sort of a, a novel. And it goes back even farther than that, I would say. Um, you know, there's a there's a novel from the 1920s or 1930s called The Citadel, um, which is a, a written, it's a fictionalized autobiography of a, a physician who was working in small coal mining town in Wales um, in the 1930s. And, and so um, very similar, you know, very limited resources, very sick patients. Um, the bigger system kind of didn't uh, didn't seem to care about his poor um, coal miners um, and, and their illnesses. And so um, I'm really curious um, maybe um, as we uh, you know start to think about what the next year, two years, three years um, of living in in whatever COVID is going to throw at us next, um, you know, how how might we use or, or think about the the role of art and literature in in uh, in the clinical space um, within the context of COVID. It's been really interesting to see like right from the start of the pandemic how um, generative it was of artists of records, you know, document art, of artistic documents. Um, I mean, my, I'm mainly working in, in comics. So I was aware of the huge flood of comics about the instructional comics, public health comics, um, but also comics documenting the experience of the pandemic. Uh, at the end of 2020, I was invited by um, Michael Green, who's a physician and, and bioethicist and a graphic medicine person, to uh, co-write the JAMA's Best in Graphic Medicine yearly annual roundup. And as we were we were thinking about it, and we thought we have to talk about COVID comics because that's just been sort of that's been a, a real thing in graphic medicine this year. And it was interesting looking back over you know we we had been sort of collecting these comics right from the start of pandemic and I've continued to kind of drag them into my folder <laughs> ever since but there's it's sort of like this really compressed history of the evolution of it's it's like this this really condensed historical document where what people were concerned about and writing stories about at the beginning you know in March 2020 in June 2020 just seemed so like oh that was so long ago by the time you look at the concerns that come up in narratives being told in July 2021. Um, so it was, yeah, it was an interesting kind of uh, really rapid paced cultural history of the pandemic. And, I, and I'm sure, and that's gonna continue um, as those works continue to, uh, to be produced. Yeah, we saw a very similar thing in the sort of, in the literary space um, you know, I was part of a group early in the pandemic where we sort of created um, an online survey for clinicians to kind of, you know, what are your thoughts? What are your fears? What is what are what is um, what keeps you going um, in these challenging moments? And we collected all of these like very short you know, one paragraph sort of narratives from people um, in the spring of 2020, again, in the fall um, when we saw when we originally sort of designed this. Um, we thought that the, by, you know, October, things would be back to normal, um, which obviously did not happen. But it was really, really um, incredible, I think, to see how people's, um, the stories that we were telling ourselves in real time were shifting, um, right, from the, the, the real, I think the fear remained throughout, um, but the way that that fear was manifesting um, was changing sort of moment by moment um, throughout, you know, the last two years. Yeah. But re related to that, at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, oh, this is going to be fantastic because people are going to learn about science. This was going to be an incredible opportunity 
because they're going to learn about a little bit about um, um, uh, statistics and um, I'm sorry, why why am I becoming drawing a blank about um, uh, what we call medicine where we um, epidemiology? Well, as statistical medicine about um, um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, medicine based on evidence, 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 medicine, evidence based medicine. And, and the simple thing about like Fauci, um, you know, at one point says no mask. And now, you know, we well, now we use masks. That's, that's the, that's the way science works, as opposed to when they turned that against him. No, that's the way science works. But it, they, they, it was a wonderful opportunity to bring that science into how viruses enter the, a, a cell, to bring that into the school system. If they could, just some basic things that they could teach about numbers and, 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 and those projections, they could they could teach because this is baby to what's going to happen in 10 years with climate change this is baby and it was a wonderful opportunity missed and 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 that's what i'm afraid of yeah i think that's that's a very very good point right like but you know do we have i guess I don't know, every time I, I start to think we might be sort of post COVID and be able to reflect back and, and prepare for the future pandemic, right? Or the future, the climate change, climate well, crisis. Um, I, I, I don't I know you, if we're I, ever I, post. I work in journalism and I saw it happening all, along the way and I kept yelling from the, from, from, I was there uh, leaving to report on this when they started um, um, the the the, sh the shutdowns of the states, and dry, I was on the road when Nome was on the road. It was fun, amazing. It was like what the uh, uh, the Walking Dead, and 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 going into Atlanta and seeing that whole thing. I, I was there on the early October, early uh, April, end of March, early April, driving on, on uh, where I was driving to, um, driving across the country. And I could, I was saying, hey, we got to cover this, we cover this. And they just, people were cutting, uh, people I was dealing with were like, no, we can't, no, what do you know? They, they just did not want to see, did not want to see. Eventually, it was so many arguments that I've had with um, people eventually coming around, you know, reflecting what the, 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 um, the, 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 that was what was happening in real time around January 6th and, and all that stuff, the, the, the fight against, uh, you know um, uh, the, the cultural issues that have that have happened with all this stupid stuff. And um, there's a, a question in the chat. This may end up being our last question, just because we're sort of coming close on time. But you know, we've all spoken about or alluded to different kinds of responsibilities as artists things like witnessing, chronicling, interpreting. Um, and the question asker um, uh, would like to know how those types of responsibilities fit with our work and experiences and, and how they clash. I mean, at least for myself, I would say that, again, I, I, I think I gravitate towards historical fiction specifically because I want to sort of separate my, my doctor self from my writer self in some ways. I think I, I bring the one into the other in terms of my approach to talking with patients and, and thinking about how I'm going to construct this, um, this novel, but, um, and the themes of the novel, but it's, it, you know, I would never, ever want somebody other than the one patient who asked me to collaborate on this, this project, um, I, I wouldn't want a patient to think that I am writing about them because, um, you know, my responsibility when I'm in a clinic room with a patient and family is to that patient and family. It's not to, you know, my, my literary ambitions. Um, at least that's the way that I've, I've sort of navigated that system. Re related to that and what I was just talking about and, and something before, about the response, the, this responsibility in the, in this in these times we're living in, and this responsibility that I and this great um, um, privilege I have of the of these subjects telling me their stories, I feel a responsibility 
to tell their story and not be intimidated by the naysayers, by the walls put in front of me, by the people who have power to, to squash my voice, to it's not my voice, not me trying to be an artist to, to make a name for myself, whatever. No, I have a responsibility to, to tell the truth of these people who have been, who are suffering and, and, and with their health to tell their story because it needs to be told. And don't feel, don't feel um, that, don't let them take that away from them. And it can be hard, really hard. Yeah, that's it's a really, it's a great question. Um, and, uh, and how the two of you have responded to that is, uh, is really powerful. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm I've had a bit of a loss. I mean, I guess I've talked, I've talked a little bit about um, the responsibility of doing things like witnessing, chronicling. There's that question of, you know, how far does some, does, does my authority over other people's like, stories extend? And I guess um, one of the, I'm, I'm trying to think of moments of clashing. And I think a lot of responsibility comes with but like being a visual communicator and now that I'm a tenured professor and I sort of have a platform, there's, there's a lot of responsibility to, to get, get stories right. And at the same time to not um, assume that those stories are authoritative. I mean, I think there's, you know, there are these sort of master narratives that, that can be really dangerous. I mean, you're, you're talking like, Max talking about January 6th, there's a sort of master narrative that was driving that it was, you know, is, is very dangerous. Um, and I think all of these little moments of, of sort of art making and reflecting kind of counter those master narratives by presenting a multiplicity of different experiences. And I think um, I'm not, this is sort of steering away from or getting me away from talking about the responsibility of witnessing, but I think that that is part of the responsibility of these stories. It's not to present them as authoritative, but, but to get them out there. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree with that. I mean, I think it, you know, what you just said about the master narrative and, and pushing against that with, with other forms of storytelling really reminds me of this concept of, you know, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie talks about the danger of a single story. Um, and when there's only one, story that's being told or one master kind of big grand narrative, um, it can feel very hard for people who are on the sides um, or on the margins to get their voice inserted into that, that bigger narrative. And, and so I think that that is perhaps one area that, you know, um, that art really can, can, can do that because it, it, again, sort of, I think, comes at things slant. Um, so wonderful. Well, it was, um, I know we're coming sort of right up on time, um, but it was so wonderful to be able to have the chance to talk with you all, um, today. Um, so thank you very much to my fellow panelists and to all of the folks who were uh, listening in and participating in the conversation through the chat. Um, the final session of this conference will convene at three p.m. Eastern time for a panel that will consider possible futures and directions for the health humanities and healthcare, um, particularly, I think, in light of the conversation, the very stimulating conversation we just had and all of the conversations that have been going on um, through the week. Um, so thanks again to everyone for the questions and insightful comments. I look forward to seeing you all in the next session. Thank you, Sam.